me undead viking i'm here to tell you about this game called immortal and as you can probably see from this bottom part it says master set one uh this is one of the reasons why i'm really excited about this game this is a game of uh it's not even really well okay let me get, take a step back here it is a game of card playing combat and i know that is a very wide uh paintbrush that that covers a lot of different uh spectrums and ideas if you will but this is a game in which uh, you are placing cards down strategically on a board of your own creation. Uh, that, uh, and by, by your own, I mean like the players that play the game. Uh, that you're placing them on the board in the attempt to either attack and take over the people's cards or, uh, you know, set up uh, combinations in, in the future, if you will. And each person is going to have a deck of cards that represents a a certain pantheon of gods. In this case, the four that I got with the game um, were American Indian, uh, uh, Greek, Norse, and Japanese. Now, uh, any D&D player worth their salt, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the gods of the Greek and Norse mythologies uh, probably roll off your tongue, and you, the, you, you they're well represented. But um, I, I was really excited to see both the Japanese and the American Indian cultures and uh, uh, mythologies uh, being well represented in, in this game. Um, Without, I mean, I, I can kind of explain, basically what you have is you're going to have a deck of 18 cards, and you're going to play a first round of battle uh, with the first nine cards that you have, and then you're going to play uh, the second round with the, the, the secondary nine cards. And after the first round of battle, the cards everybody uses um, are more powerful the, 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 during the second battle. And during the second battle, you're actually going to, both the players are going to actually change the, the game board and actually are going to expand it and make it larger. And so you have to make decisions uh, based on um, setting yourself up for that second part of the battle, if you will. So uh, I realize that's probably pretty confusing to, exp to uh, teach you without actually seeing how the game is played. So let me show you how that's done here, and then we'll come back here and I'll talk more uh, about uh, Immortal. All right, cool. Let's do this. All right, this is the game of Immortal, and I have kind of set up the game, but I do want to actually take a quick step backwards just so you can have an idea of how the game is played and how you set up the game because the setup of the game uh, is almost as important in a lot of ways as uh, the actual playing if you will because this isn't a game where you're going to be setting it up and it's going to be the same each and every time that you play. Uh, for beginners you see these four decks here they all look the same obviously but each of these is different. Um, they are uh, each one is a, uh, a different pantheon of the gods. Um, for example, uh, this is uh, the Greek mythology. You can see here's Zeus there, um, and then you know Artemis and Perseus and so on and so forth. And on this card, there's going to be several uh, factors that you have to take into effect. And this, just looking at Zeus here, uh, you can see that. Um, he is of the sky element, which is what this lightning bolt uh, means right here. He, this means that he is from the Greek pantheon. Uh, this is his special ability. Uh, it's, he's a champion, and so he gains uh, extra. There's extra bonuses given by him and received by him uh, if he is located next to other people from his pantheon, which is what this symbol here means. And I'll go into more depth, if you will, uh, with each of the different abilities that all the cards have, because there's a ton of different abilities. Uh, so this is just Zeus, for, so to speak. And then these numbers here: two, six, eight, and six. That is the strength of his attacking ability and defense um, in those directions. And this is always considered north, west, east, and south. And so, like, compare Zeus, and you can notice also this Roman numeral 3 means that he is a third level card. He's like one of the more po uh, powerful cards. And you, each character, each deck, and some of this art, unfortunately, isn't, you know, new. So, I mean, I can only imagine that the Poseidon art is going to be just as awesome as Zeus. Uh, but you can see, like, here's Poseidon. He's a champion uh, of sea, if you will. And his are uh, four, 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 and eight, you know, and so, like, you know, slightly different. And then here's Hades, you know, and uh, and that means that he's a slayer instead of when he wins a battle. Normally, you take over uh, people's uh, cards, but but uh, Hades is a slayer. He'll destroy them and sends them to the underworld. And so, okay, so that's those are the three. Here's like Apollo. 
uh, you know, Hephaestus. Um, that's like a mimic ability, allows him to uh, steal uh, the abilities of other uh, cards that he's next to. I notice that these are the directions in which that he can do that. And so, and those steal obviously, um, well, I shouldn't say obviously, those will steal from both uh, your own, if you want, or it can steal from an opponent as well. Um, and then going to like your, your top level guys, like the Minotaur. He doesn't have any special abilities, but you know he's strong. Six, three, two, five. You know, centaurs. You know, they, they don't have special abilities, but you know they might just be stronger. Um, this is a range attack. It means that they can attack actually two spaces away. The number of arrows determines how far away that particular action can go. And so, like you know, a harpies uh, can range attack, and it's in this direction, if you will. And so then there's the different uh, areas that they'll go, and the different uh, directions that those actions will go. So, um, and those are the level one. So when you start off, you actually will take um, five, you take the top nine cards: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've actually my taking the top nine is because I've actually already, in this case, uh, set up like the top nine. These are all your Act One cards. And so you take those and you shuffle those up, and then you'll have the rest over on the other side because you're only going to have the Act One cards at your disposal. Now, before I get too far in, I just want to show you the other uh, pantheons quick. Um, here is, you know, uh, Odin. Obviously, this is going to be uh, Thor and, and and the Norse mythos, if you will. Cert, the Midgard Serpent. Here's Thrym, Heimdall, Freya, Thor, of course, Fenrir, Loki, Slipner. That's, if you don't know who Slepner is, I've always liked Slepner. That's the eight-legged horse of Odin. But And so then they have these... Oh, I, I want to show you. Tyr, the one-handed god of justice. Um, you know, missing in hand. But I like this ability, Scar. The ability of Scar is the fact that um, if he is defeated in battle or captured, um, anybody who fights him actually then gets a minus one token. They're less powerful uh, after they've defeated him because he's scarred them. It's kind of a cool ability that uh, Tyr has. I'm kind of a, being Norwegian, I'm kind of a, I like playing the Norse gods. So, you know, Hal, and so there you go. Uh, the Valkyries and what have you. Okay, and then that is them. Okay, and then we have, uh, the. this is the uh, Japanese pantheon. And so, you know, and once again, I have the temp art for some of these, but like Ryujin, pretty cool looking. That's a swift ability. I'm kind of touched on these. I said I was going to go over all of them uh, when, at once, but just Swift is kind of cool. When you place it, you kind of do your attacks. This is kind of a cool ability. Notice how powerful Ryujin is to the west. And so you place the you place it, and you go through your attacks with with the the card that you placed, and then you immediately then after that's done. Um, you get to move it in one direction, and so the arrows kind of tell you where you can move. So, like, you can move diagonal, and then if you're in a spot where you can do another attack at that point, they get to attack again. Kind of a cool little ability that anybody Swift has. Um, this is kind of cool. Like, this gives a bonus of attack and defense of one uh, versus anybody of the Sky Domain. You know, and so you know, kind of that's what that means. Um, uh, this is actually kind of cool. Um, the Maelstrom effect, what that does, it causes the uh, the cards on either side to spin, do a 180. So you'll actually force them uh, to maybe switch up their defenses and attacks uh, to be worse uh, after you when you place the card. And so, so there you go. That is uh, the Japanese uh, pantheon. And finally, and this is, I thought this was really cool, and this made my dad happy. Uh, I play lots of games with my dad, so um, and he's a big, uh, as he's, as, when he retired, he started doing a lot of research into uh, American Indian uh, mythology and, and culture and what have you, and this is the American Indian culture, and, and he plays this one a lot. And so, you know, the Great Spirit, uh, the Great Turtle, and, um, you know, Uktana, which is like this, this, uh, he actually knew it. It's like a serpent that, that like lives in the swamps, and and uh, you know if you fight it, it most likely will kill you. But if you run from it, um, uh, you bring misfortune to your family. So you should battle it to the death, if you will. Um, you know the thunderbird, and so on and so forth. Um, this is kind of cool ability. This is the shaman. The shaman ability is a really powerful ability in that it uh, prevents a lot of the negative uh, effects that normally would happen to it. Uh, not occur. They, they, they're, they're protected from those. Um, but uh, they can still be, you know, claimed and taken over as normal in battle, if you will. And so, the Wendigo! And, uh, uh, so there you go. So that's the American Indian uh, uh, pantheon, if you will. So, 
each person is going to get a deck and they're going to get uh, control markers you to determine uh, which one is theirs. And what they're going to do is each person that's playing, and I've kind of just set up a two-player game here, um, each person that's playing is going to uh, pl take a board that's over there, and I just grabbed a couple here, and they're going to place them on the board. So one person will place a board first, like so. Now you can place the board um, to the alpha or omega side. This is the alpha side, as you can see uh, by the letter A. That's right there. Um, but you can place the other side, and this is the Omega side, and obviously you can see there's some different uh, spots on the board on the Omega side. Now this is like kind of like, a, I'm going to kind of show you the basic game here, I'm not going to show you the full game, but I just want to show you this really quick. So when you do show um, uh, the Omega side, and you don't have to, like you can agree before the game, you're all going to use Omega, you're going to use Alpha, or it's up to the player to decide which side they want to use you enact these certain abilities of the spots. And very basically, um, if you place a card on a spot, like if you place a, a, uh, a water-based card in this one, this is water, and, um, you know, and so other cards, you know, will have, uh, will have, like, uh, you know, the air as well as water, and there's ones that have the, the fire as well. Um, uh, you then, uh, you enact... Uh, that that power. So if you place a, a card that has the same symbol on that, it gives them uh, plus one uh, to their, their 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 power. You know, plus one to their attack, their defense, what have you. If you place them on a spot like this that has a black border on it, they gain the ability of that particular spot when they're placed on that location. In this case, they get swift, and then they get to move just like normal. Now, if a swift creature gets placed on a swift spot, they actually get to use both. They get to you, you know, do this, do both of their, their swift actions, which can be very powerful, for, for example. So, but in this case, like I said, we're gonna be using the opposite side. And so uh, you can see uh, there's uh, this, uh, uh, face down, and then the, when the next player goes, they have to place one with it. And now they have to place it in such a way that um, there's two of the squares match up and are connected with two of the squares. So, for example, this is completely valid. This would be completely valid. So with this, but this would not, because it would not work, because they're not, uh, they're, they're only connected with the one spot there. Um, likewise, you can't turn it and go like that. You have to, you have to, one, it has to all, all be set up in the exact same way. So, in this case, like I had before, we can go ahead and set up the, uh, the, the, the board like so, and that is a completely valid and, 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 uh, that, that will work. So, in the case, this case, we're playing two players, so I'm just going to take those two decks, I'm going to put those aside, and we're going to take... Um, both the Norse gods and we're going to take uh, the Greek gods. And in this case, since I'm playing both, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I've already uh, set these up prior to the game. You draw the first, you take the other, put it to the side, and each player gets five card deck to start with. Like so. And then one, two, three, four, five. So, and let's just turn these over. So here is uh, the Norse, and here is uh, the Greek. And then uh, you figure out uh, which player is going to be first player by whichever way you're going to do. You can just say the person that's more experienced goes first, or you can, you know, if we're going to use, you know, black and white for the colors, you know, we could just shake these up, draw one. Okay, so black's going to be first. So, uh, you know, the, the, the Greek mythos, if you will, is going to be first. And the first thing you do is you have to take one of your five cards and you have to place it face down on the board and without being able to see. Now, the only thing with this is that um, you, you won't be attacking with them. So maybe you want to pick something that has special ability that, you know, that doesn't, uh, you don't want to use something that has like a, a really cool ability that you don't want to use up, if you will. So, uh, you know, you might want to just take like something that just that has some standard sides or whatever, and you're going to want to place it on the board. Now, you're going to have to do two things. One, the person who first plays uh, the card on the board is going to determine which way is north. So, this is always considered to be the north side. This is always considered to be the south, west, and east. So, in this case, you can either, you can play the card like so, or like so. And as soon as you play that, that will determine 
which way is north for the rest of the game. It won't switch, and all cards have to be placed likewise in that situation. There is some cards that break the rules and, be, and change that, but for the most part, you have to actually put, you know, to the north or to the south. And so in this case, you know, he isn't really powerful, uh, you know, to the, the, the uh, west or to the north. So if you can find a way to place him in a spot where, um, you know, hopefully like, you know, he doesn't, isn't exposed on the two spots that are bad, you know, that would be good. But, you know, and unfortunately, you know, we can maybe go, um, you know, I, I'd rather, because, you know, it is Heracles, it is, it is Hercules, if you will. I'd rather keep that open, and I don't want to lose the five, but I don't, I want to protect him. So you could, in this case, you could go ahead and place him like that. Now, of course, this is going to be upside down, like so. And the cool thing is, is that if you're wondering when, because the, the first ones you place are upside down, this, as you'll notice, is got uh, like this little curlicue, and this is feathers. The feather side is north. So you go ahead and you place that there, and then you place your token on the card to show that that is yours and you control it. And then after you've done that, you draw another card, you put it in your hand, and you, then the other person will go. And so now the other person will go, and like they got to think the same way. And now they got to think north, and they got to think of uh, you know a, a card that'll work well and uh, you know won't uh, you know, fit well into the spots. And so you know, hmm, well we have like the Valkyries; they're pretty good, and th these are good against uh, the water. So hmm. A lot of good choices here, actually. For I played these a lot more. I don't want to play him just yet because, well, actually, let's play him. Let's play fair. And so, notice like uh, he is strong north and south, um, but you know not so much east and west. So maybe we can you know place him. You know he's strong to the north, so we're going to place it there. And so he's got a pretty strong uh, total facing north like that. Now, when you're placing these face down, this also is for three or four players, you can't ever, draw a card, you can't ever place a card in this face down phase next to each other. And there are certain abilities that won't um, take effect. Like, you know, uh, disc range attacks don't take effect. Um, you know, things like that that normally would when you place it and do an attack, because you can't attack right now, those don't happen. So after you've done that, then each person then flips over the card and reveals what they've picked. And then when, now uh, we would begin uh, the whole process of actually going back and forth and, and you know, doing the battle for Act 1 of, of the game. So I'm not going to go through the whole process of each you know step back and forth, back and forth, because I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to bore you. I don't want to do a complete playthrough. But let me show you how an attack works. So let's say we want to try to take Frere, if you will, and I'm I'm the, I'm the Greek player. Well, I have to figure out a way um, to place the card and place a card that is going to defeat them. And so you know, and you have to be more. Now I, I should mention here. I'm just going to show you a quick. This is a phalanx ability, and this is uh, an ability that a lot of the, the, the Greek cards have. Um, the phalanx ability, what it does is every uh, card that's in, like from that direction forward, like the four spaces above, or in this case, the four spaces to the right uh, of, of Perseus, gain a plus one uh, to their abilities. And so, you know, that's pretty powerful. But, and also, if there's any... Um, any uh, uh, enemies in that, they get a minus one as well. And so, you know, in this situation, you know, we do have like a pretty good uh, card here, Medusa. And Medusa is, you know, if we played Medusa here, Medusa has a six uh, to, you know, the, the, the three, and that would be a really easy win uh, for us to do it. But in this case, she's a slayer. She's going to just she's going to kill the things instead of capturing them. And the whole point of this game is whoever captures has the most cards and controls the most area is the winner. So, whereas this is a pretty good card, a pretty good uh, ability to have in certain cases when there's just a, something out there that's um, you know bugging you and 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 you know not uh, 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 and is is like trying to uh, is something you have to remove you know because it has special ability or has special power that's really affecting a lot of other things. That isn't what I want to do right now. So what I'd much rather do is I would much rather uh, just, you know, 
destroy it, if you will. So, or, or, or you take it over. But he has a five to the north, and Perseus has a five, so you know that's not going to help. But you know he does have a phalanx ability there. So what we could do is we could, um, if you will, because normally now this is a very important thing to do. Normally, if you attack something but you don't defeat it. Nothing bad happens. Um, you know, it's just unless they have a counterattack ability, and and I know that I'll show you the counterattack ability because I know some of the the Norse ones have it. So what we could do is we could kind of maybe set things up for a, a later turn, if you will. So what we could do is uh, let's see here. Uh, we could place uh, actually let's not place the Perseus card. Let's 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 choose our Cerberus card. Now, you know the Cerberus has a 4, 4, and 2, 4. So, he's pretty good, right? And you'll notice that he also has this mimic ability that he can mimic a card in any direction. Now, I'm not going to use the mimic ability in this situation just because um, it's one of those things where I want to be able to take that card over. Now, you'll notice that this particular ability does not have a, a yellow a ring around it. Like so. There's no yellow ring there. So... Uh, the old ring means it's ongoing. It's kind of like a permanent thing. It's it's an enduring ability, if you will. But you know, this is a one-time action. Now, if like I wanted to take that ability, what I could do? Well, let's actually do that here. I could place Cerberus in this location right there, and I could immediately say I am taking uh, this. The I am mimicking or I'm taking uh, the ability. Now you don't have to take. Uh, the ability if you don't want to but so what you do then is you place the mimic ability on there and then to remind yourself that you you because now he's lost that ability it's gone he doesn't get the plus two uh versus the lightning bolt if you will um you can go ahead and you can place a marker if you will like you can go like this and this kind of helps this helps me to remember uh which one it is so you can go plus one plus one to that actually I'm sorry, plus one, plus one. I like, because then that looks like defense or whatever, the, the, the gold thing around there. That will remind us that this has a plus two because he's stolen that ability uh, from that particular creature. Now, when it, we haven't, you know, we haven't taken those over by any means, or we haven't, uh, we haven't taken, uh, oh, I forgot to put the little marker on there to show it's ours. We haven't taken that one over yet, but uh, we have taken away uh, part of its power and, and you know and uh, what it can do. And so then we draw another card from our deck and place it in there. And now we have uh, the Thor's turn. Now he's got the trolls, which are awesome. I, I do I do like the trolls because they're pretty powerful. Um, and I do uh, like uh, um, here I, these are the ones that can counter attack so if they if somebody attacks them and is unable to defeat them they attack back immediately and then they can they have the possibility of you know destroying them and taking them from the from the that, that spot I should point out that um, hell has this ability right here this means that they're a traitor now what that means is is that if somebody takes uh, uh, hell uh, and like like uh, you know captures them, they uh they they immediately then go to the other person's deck and goes to the top of their deck, meaning that they get to recruit them then on their when they draw the card and they can then use their ability. Of course, they can go back and forth if they're they're captured, but that's what that little serpent symbol means there. But in this case, what we're going to do is since we have these trolls, what we can do is we want to, huh. Well, we can put the trolls down, actually. They're really powerful, but they don't do much else. We can go ahead and put the trolls down. They have a 6 to the north, and they have a 1 to the west. Well, they're not going to be able to defeat Freyr to the west, even though he's you know, we've taken away some of his ability. He doesn't, even though it wouldn't work, because the, the lightning bolt, this is a fire, if you will. So we're going to attack, but we're going to capture, actually. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and place that one on the troll, and then we're going to replace this with that. Now the cool thing here is that it retains the ability that they're mimicking. Um, so uh, he doesn't lose that because we've taken over them. If we actually even destroyed uh, this this particular, destroyed Cerberus, we had a Slayer card if you will, or we had somebody to remove it, 
the ability does never does go back to the person that they're mimicked. It's kind of it's it's a really powerful ability the mimics have. Um, but remember that we we actually played that wrong the first time we played. We thought oh we destroyed it, then he get gets the ability back. But no, it actually does not occur like that. So that's how you capture something. Pretty simple, right? You draw another card. We got tier, which I like. It's pretty cool. And then let me just do one more turn here, and I'm going to show you what happens with Act Two of the battle. So now we have uh, this ability, and well, you know, and, and we're kind of uh, like hurting right now because of the fact that um, you know we've only got the one person, Heracles, up there. And so looking at this, we, we notice we got those three creatures, but we have an open spot here. If we could find maybe something to put in there that would be powerful. But even Medusa, you know, can't, unfortunately, you know, she's only got a five to the five. That wouldn't do anything. And, but we have a five to the right, and it is, you know, this matches up, but it doesn't get the plus two defense, which is good. A five to the right, and it's range of two. And so we can go ahead and place the harpies, like so. It has a range combat of two. It goes over here. They have then a five to the four. That is defeated, and then we would go ahead and claim our, our Cerberus back um, from the trolls that defeated them. Now, this is kind of like the whole seesaw of the game um, that, that will, will take place during this first round of the combat. Now, I'm not going to show, I'm not going to place all these cards down because you can kind of get the ebb and flow. You're going to be going back and forth, controlling, uh, trying to put your cards in the best possible places so they can't get defeated. Um, once either all these spots are filled on the board or that or somebody else has uh like placed all played all their cards that they have and they can't draw any more cards then you go into act two and then during act two is when you will actually then claim your more powerful cards you'll you'll your act two and act three cards if you will and so in that case what you do then is each person is allowed to go through this deck of, of of lands and each person then gets to place one so one person could go like this and add another another land and the other person uh goes and they could you know add um and the same rules apply they have to be, they have to at least be next to each other uh like two of the spaces have to connect so you couldn't go you know well you couldn't do this actually because then two are connected but i don't want to do that that kind of looks silly but out of the way I will go ahead and place this one like so and so then now you've increased the the battlefield area if you will now these spots these void spots um range attacks can go over that uh it's still considered a spot but um you, you can get over that and there are actually some uh some some uh creatures that are called void walkers and you can find these in like the japanese pantheon um that actually can be placed in these void uh sections because uh they have the ability as a void walker to be placed in that empty spot now play continues uh like this like i said then each person then will unlock uh you know their their higher level uh beings if you will they're their act two and act three uh characters uh, during this phase, so we get you know Odin and Freya, and then the same thing happens where each person gets to play cards, and then until either somebody can't play cards anymore or the, all the spots are filled on the board, the game is over. At that point, then you count up who controls the most spaces. Whoever controls the most spaces will be the winner or the victor, uh, and then obviously the other person loser. In a three or four player game, obviously then you everybody gets to compare and like if like and the person who has the most wins. If you have a uh, situation where you've matched up um, like the same number of spaces, like this happens a lot more, not so much in two player games, but in um, for me it happened with three player games and four player games more. Um, like you know two people have like ten spots or something like that. When that happens, uh, you then total up the total amount of characters that they control, the level of the characters, whether it's a three, a two, or a one. And you total up the total amount of those that they control, or they, they you know those characters, and then whoever has the most there uh, will win the game. And now there's a there's a further tiebreaker after that, but I, you know, that's never happened for us. But we did have a couple of tiebreakers with three and four player games, uh, where we had to actually go to the power of the creatures that we had left. 
Uh, so there you go. I mean, that's that's pretty much uh, how you play the game. I mean, you do get a, a and this is just this uh, particular like master set one. There's gonna be more uh, with more uh, heroes. You do get a sheet that, that details all the different. Um, you know, uh, abilities of each one. Um, like the American Pantheon uh, has the Skinwalker. Um, you can place that uh, occupied by another card, and then you just, it takes the place of that card. Um, the Champion, as I said, gains plus one bonus from to all its strengths for each adjacent card that is a symbol that matches that symbol. Um, you, uh, the only one that I think I didn't, no, I think I did actually show everything because I showed you the trader and I showed you the counter attack. So, uh, I mean, they have a lot of varied abilities, but the trick is how to use your own abilities uh, to counteract the ones that you're fighting. And when you start playing um, the two player game of this game really shines, you know, just because it's very strategic and back and forth. But with three or four, the chaos is a little, is, is increased a little bit, but in a good way, because at that point, then you might be doing really well against uh, one of the people that you're up against, but there'll be somebody that's more suited to you to like to, to fight against you because of like just the cards that you have out there. And you have to kind of protect yourself uh, from those attacks that that person's making. And it's, it's very challenging and a lot of fun. So, so there you go. Uh, that is how to play uh, Immortal. So let me tell you uh, more about the game in my conclusion. All right, there is Immortal. All right, so uh, thank you uh, for sitting through the uh, gameplay portion of this video. Um, so what do I think of the game? Well, I was... When, when I when the creator of the game contacted me and asked me if I were interested in taking a look at it, um, I thought you know it's it, there's only so many these like kind of and and it's hard I think this game really is a two player game. However, um, I really enjoy the three and four player, which is something I actually really enjoy or what I found surprising when when the when the game was actually presented to me and was suggested to me, I was like, oh okay, here's another uh, two player card game, and that's a great genre of games. I I enjoy a great deal uh, many of them. Uh, in the past, like. Uh, uh, like like Undead Viking from four years ago, uh, probably wouldn't be too excited about uh, playing a, another two-player card game. But um, as my culture of, of my gaming, if you will, uh, uh, has changed, I've, I've started to really enjoy um, the head-to-head, -head, uh, one person against the other uh, type of gaming experience more. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that I've gotten my wife to play a few more games with me, and also that... Um, I had the same game group for many, many years, but then I've kind of branched out and I have my bizarro gaming group, as I lovingly call them. Um, and uh, uh, I, I call them that because they're they're very much um, like if you watch the old Seinfeld episodes, uh, when, the, when Jerry runs into that other group of friends that are kind of like all of them are kind of like his main group of friends. They're like his bizarro friends, if you will. And so I found... This, this, this bizarre group, and each person had a, the group had a person that reminded me very much of my, my gaming group that I've had for, you know, three decades, if you will. So, uh, regard, <laughs> regardless, um, so, but one of them, uh, my friend Jim, uh, in my Bizarro Gaming Group, he uh, he plays a lot of these two-player games, and I've enjoyed a great deal, many of them, uh, with him. And it's kind of opened uh, my mind up to uh, the, the, the two-player game uh, experience. So... Uh, when this was presented to me, I was, like, really excited about it. And then he's like, oh, and then it can be played to three or four people. And a lot of the games that are, they say, oh, you can play with three or four people... You say, okay, fine, but it, it's one of those things where you feel like that rule is kind of shoehorned in. You know, it's like, well, you know, we have this really good two-player game, but we want to make sure we hey, appeal to people that have, like, a three-player game or a four-player game. We want to appeal to that group. And, and like, either one or two things happens. Either one, they say, well, you need to buy another, another set, and then you can play four-player. And here's these four-player rules that don't really quite work, but these, these you, you can play it. And, but you always end up just playing a two-player because it just works better that way. Um, but here was a game that, one, it's all four-player to start with, and two, I actually was enjoying it more with three and four play players than it was with two, just basically because um, I found the, the, the way that the, all four of the Pantheons kind of uh, fought and, and mixed together, um, I, I really enjoyed um, how well... Uh, you know, you had, or how well of a game plan you had to make in order to be successful. Because you could know, you you could play um, the Norse gods, and you could say, "All oh, my strength is to the north." You know, that's normally, you know, they're, they're kind of their strength, and you can kind of you know play that sort of a game where where you're, you're but but 
you're if you are playing against um, somebody that you know is playing like uh, both you, if you're playing a game that both against a, a, ja a Japanese mythology and say American Indian mythology, it's going to be different than you're just going straight up against like you know just the Greeks or something like that. I mean, and the fact that you have to keep that in mind and keep uh, you know your wherewithal around you, if you will. Uh, it opens up doors and opens up different uh, avenues of attack and defense and the, the different abilities. Um, for example, I was always really glad when I didn't have to fight uh, against uh, like uh, the American Indian uh, uh, mythology, basically because they they have this trickster ability that is that is very uh, I don't like it. It it is it messes with my plans and and and, and ideas and uh, it, it it but it's very powerful and it's very interesting and and the fact that like if you have to plan if you have to plan for that you're you're uh, you're, you're strategies and your your uh, uh, what your focus is going to be on has to change accordingly and whereas the combat is much more chaotic with those three or four players and and you know like by the time it gets back to you the the, the battle front has changed control has shifted never what have you um, it, it, it it was just a lot more fun <laughs> Because of the fact that not only did you you have to be cognizant of, of where your strengths were and which opponent you had the best ability to attack was, but you also found yourself doing suboptimal plays because of the fact that you're getting towards the end of the game and say, you know, the, the Greeks are winning and you, you have to focus on, on taking them down and, and you know, so you can you have a chance at winning and so you and and as the player that's in the lead, you actually know that you're forcing people to make some of those suboptimal moves and, and, and plan accordingly uh, to have those things done. And it, it is a uh, wonderful uh, mishmash and, and, uh, and, and bloody, <laughs> well, as bloody as cards can be, uh, uh, you know, result, if you will. And it is very uh, uh, taxing on the brain. And I, I always like games that make me... Um, anxious uh for my turn you know looking at your cards seeing what you can do seeing your abilities and and hoping uh that the people that are coming across just don't attack me don't attack me leave those cards where they are they, you know, you're just you're just like kind of doing turn to your mental mind trick of like don't go after that guy you know and trying to like you know make sure that your little combo your little uh, strategy that you set up uh stays intact by the time it gets back to you so um for that reason i really really enjoyed uh like the four player games and even the three player games for uh, of, of of the of immortal um as a two-player game it still shines it, it, and and it has this wonderful tactics act, act uh uh aspect to it and as you learn the decks and you learn the different abilities of each one of them, you can kind of plan ahead uh and this is one of those games that the more you play it the more avenues it opens up for you now there's lots of different ways you can play the game uh you can play uh, like uh teams against each other uh, you can play um, like this skirmish. You can you can play chaos. You know, and 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 uh, you can go to the the the, the uh, web you know, like the Kickstarter page. You can go to um, you look at the rules and you can read about those other different uh, tactics. And I've played those, but I mean, I think the game shines when we played it with the four player um, games and also like the two player head to head ones, if you will. Uh, you know, the game if you're if you're if you're a person that enjoys um, like a, the the, the card game or card driven war games if you will um not so much like true war games but i mean card um card driven conflict games if you will uh i think you'll enjoy this i enjoyed this game strangely because it didn't have dice i like the fact that the, the the combat was very deterministic and you you would study your cards and like you'd and like you i even showed you during the game my gameplay it was like i was i was like oh i'll detect this no no that's not going to work really well okay I'll do this no no that's not going to work really well and sometimes you just have a situation where you have five cards and none of them really are going to give you that that instance so now you have to go to like your subroutine your 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 change up your plans to say okay let's try this instead. What can I set myself up for for the next turn? And if you learn the cards of your deck, then you can say, well, if I can just get, you know, uh, the Minotaur card, or if I can just, you know, get, um, you know, my, my tier card, if you will, uh, then this will really work together with that. And so, you know, it's it's one of those things. Like I said, it, the game becomes better and becomes more involved uh, when you learn all the cards and when you can then really start uh, making, um, you know long lasting strategies this is one of those games that I, when i get done playing it 
especially if I lost, I'd say, what could I have done differently? What could I, how could I have played uh, uh, my, my, my gods uh, differently in that situation to, to give myself a better chance to win? And then they always made me want to just get right back in there and, 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 and try again, you know? And the fact that the game can be played in about 20 minutes is a real selling point as well. This is definitely um, a great game that you can play a quick game of while you're waiting for everybody else to show up for your big game night. You, you can, fit, like I said, finish up a game within 20 minutes and uh, then, you know, move on to something bigger or you know turn, turn it into an evening you know i mean like play like three or four games of it as well so um there you go uh immortal uh go ahead and check it out um thank you as always for uh, taking the time to watch this video i greatly appreciate it and until next time uh this was undead viking and i'm telling you to have yourself one heck of an awesome day all right bye bye